Welcome to our first lunch forum of Mission Emphasis Week. Uh, there is something uh, absolutely biblical about sharing meals together, uh, and I apologize for intruding on that biblical uh, norm, uh, uh, though I might ask you to continue to enjoy the, um, the fruit of the land uh, there before you, even as we bring our panelists uh, up here to uh, continue the conversation in part that we began in the chapel uh, with, uh, with Dr. Carroll earlier this morning uh, in thinking about people on the move, uh, mission and diaspora. We're thinking today in the lunch forum about ministry in multi-ethnic context. Uh, there are few contexts that are no longer multi-ethnic, uh, and so part of the great reality is adjusting to reality, uh, and we want to sort of tackle that uh, issue topically across the panel, and so uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists if they might just join us uh, up. I'm going to uh, let David um, moderate the panel, but uh, let me just say a quick word and then have each of the panelists say a quick word about themselves. Uh, I think the chairs are, are there before us. Um, Dr. Carroll, hopefully you know already, uh, uh, Dr. Danny Carroll from Denver Seminary, uh, our plenary speaker this week. Um, beside uh, Danny is uh, Jeanette Yep from Grace Chapel in Lexington. I'll have them say each a little bit more. Bianca Dumling uh, uh, from Emmanuel Gospel Center and our very own Song Park uh, from our Boston campus. Uh, David, shall I turn things over to you now? Okay. Um, today we have these distinguished panelists, and we have chosen them primarily because they represent a certain uh, ethnic uh, community that they are um, coming out from an experience of. And so I'm going to ask first of each of the panelists to just introduce themselves and also the, the people that they are primarily working with and have come from. Uh, Danny Carroll Rodas. Um, I attend an Hispanic church, Iglesia El Camino, uh, in Metro Denver. Hi, I'm Jeanette Yep, and I serve as the pastor of Global and Regional Outreach at Grace Chapel uh, down on, in Lexington. And my claim to fame is that I'm actually... Uh, depending on how you count it, probably second generation Chinese American. My grandfather was one of the first immigrants to Boston Chinatown. He came at the end of the Qing Dynasty in 1901 and uh, was one of the first settlers here. So uh, I'm long time uh, Bostonian. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bianca Dumling and I work for Emmanuel Gospel Center as the Assistant Director of Intercultural Ministry. So like my ethnic group is German, but I... <laughs> I work uh, with a lot of different ethnic groups right now with the Ethiopians, and, but also like Nepalese and Cambodians and others. So we work generally with the immigrant community at Emmanuel Gospel Center. Hi, I'm Song Park, uh, the assistant dean of the Boston campus and uh, ass assistant professor of Old Testament there. Uh, was born in South Korea, was raised in South America, studied in Israel, and uh, teach in America. <laughs> so I still strive to maintain all these different ties uh, from those different areas. Uh, in Boston, uh, I founded a Korean church uh, 10 years ago in urban area, and then currently I preach uh, in a Hispanic church. Wow, quite diverse. So I don't even know where to begin. Okay, you know what? Let's start with uh, Dr. Park here. Let me ask you, can you just explain to us just about the Korean church and, and how it's grown and, and, and what, what don't we know about you guys? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to take this question uh, to expand to a little broader uh, 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 frame because Church in Korea has always been uh, migrant. As some of you may know, uh, Christianity reached Korea at the end of the 19th century, and it was in 1907 that there was the great revival. Uh, 
some people say, even greater than the one that happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So the great revival of Korea happened in Pyongyang, 1907. And you may know Pyongyang currently is the capital city of North Korea. Right after that great revival comes the Japanese regime where Korea is lost. And with that begins Korean immigration to North America, partly facilitated by the American missionaries themselves. So during that long period of Japanese regime where there is no point of return for those who have come over to America, uh, it is the American church here that will foster that particular immigrant group, which was nascent and uh, raised up within their own uh, cradle, and then they see, him, see them refugees here, and for over four decades, church in America uh, took care of them. So church in exile is the first phase of uh, Korean church in America. And then since 1965, when the doors for immigration is open to the Asian community, uh, a huge influx of uh, uh, Koreans along with other Asians will happen. Uh, and currently the number reaching 2 million uh, Korean residents uh, living in America and 7 million living abroad overall. So since 1964, we would say the Korean church in America is an immigrant church. But we should remember that there was a long phase before that, until 1964, where we used to identify ourselves as the church in exile. But the wonderful thing is, while that is the story of the Korean church in America, what happened back in Korea was that the Christians who had to flee from a Japanese regime, and after that, the communism, uh, communism in, uh, after 1945, huge uh, number of Christians from the north will take refuge in South Korea as well, and that's how gospel actually reaches Korea. And that's very similar to what happens back in the book of Acts. A church in Jerusalem fleeing the persecution and that way evangelizing uh, Samaria. So my mother, fleeing from North Korea, a Christian, will marry my father, a southerner, a Buddhist. And you see how the gospel will reach that family more than 2,000 years old and for the first time hearing the gospel. So church in migration, fleeing from Japanese regime and then communism, that has given rise to what is the church in Korea and in America the Korean church in America today. Thank you, Dr. Park. And so moving on to Bianca. Bianca, can you bring the uh, microphone closer to you? Um, I'd like to ask you, Bianca, you know, you're at the Emmanuel Gospel Center, and you've done a lot of research. Uh, you know there's a lot of multi-ethnic groups. You yourself are German immigrant here in Boston. But there is something what we've heard of a quiet revival taking place in the Boston area. Can you tell us a little more about what's happening with the different churches, ethnic groups here? Yeah. So basically, the growth pattern of immigrant churches are closely connected to the immigration policies. And so in, uh, with the Immigration and Nationality Act, mm -hmm. Act of 1965, um, the doors were open and more immigrants were coming to the U US and also like to Boston. And so the consequence is that more and more um, immigrant churches are developing and we really know well what's happening in Boston because since the 1970s like EGC is having the church directory and um, could track what's happening as they did research on the churches and doing that like we realized that there was a decline of mainline churches and I mean New England is called like the crave, spiritual graveyard of the nation but at the same time, there was a growth of immigrant churches. Um, and, and so there was like this spiritual vitality in New England that has not been recognized and seen because it didn't happen 
within the majority culture, but uh, in storefront churches and within um, the ethnic groups who came to, um, to Boston and to New England. And EGC has called it the quiet revival because it's quiet because no one really recognized it. And, but it's getting louder and louder and, and people are more aware that there is vitality and growth within the immigrant communities. And basically today we have about just under 700 churches in the Boston area and 83% of them are immigrant or African American, so not Euro European American. And there are um, more than 110 nationalities are represented in these churches and there are services in about 30 languages. And um, one interesting thing, like in 2007, together with Grace Chapel, actually we had um, a consultation, um, an intercultural leadership consultation, and gathered information about the story of all the immigrant groups coming to New England, and it's the New England Books of Acts that's also online, and you, you basically can see how the immigrant communities, the churches have grown and in the past um, 40, 50 years. And one example is like, the first Haitian church, for example, was in 1969, like in Boston, and today we have about 54 Haitian churches, and the same can be told for many, many other ethnic groups. So there is really like vitality and life within these churches. Great, great. Okay, moving to Jeanette. Jeanette uh, has been uh, with InterVarsity for about 20, 30 years. Uh, I don't know how many years, but she's known to me as Auntie Jeanette, and I've known her since, she's known me since I was a little kid, but anyways, she has been involved with uh, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, multi-ethnic ministries, the VP of InterVarsity in, in charge of multi-ethnic ministries. Now, though, she's at Grace Chapel, and she's the global awareness pastor there, and so she has also observed lots of uh, not just within the Asian American uh, cult, uh, churches, but also now at an Anglo multi-ethnic church now has seen that kind of growth. So Jeanette, I'll just hand over the time to you and you can share. Yeah, I just um, make comments about our my current context, which is Grace Chapel. And a lot of folk here in New England know it's kind of a, a mega church. It's mega only because it's in New England. We're about 3,000 people and in other parts of the world. We're like the Sunday school department of Willow Creek, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but here it's important and we have a couple campuses that we've just started. But multi-ethnicity has been a big part of what has, God has given to Grace Chapel, which is kind of exciting. For me, when I was growing up here in New England, I was here and then I took off for the Midwest and I was there in the Midwest for about 25 years. And when I was a kid growing up here in New England, um, it was the big white church, you know, Gordon McDonald, white church, white people, you know, all that. Sorry, but that's how I knew it. And then when, when I came and candidated, I looked, I said, holy moly, this isn't your father's Oldsmobile anymore. It really was different. And, um, we're, and I think David mentioned it at chapel, but we're about 30% non-European American. And um, as I think about it, I, you know, I also spent a lot of time in the uh, Chinese American church, not, was, not in exile, but I was serving and, and working in the English congregations um, in different churches, both in Boston and in Chicago. And uh, one thing I found as I talked to the Asians, and particularly the Chinese I find at Grace Chapel, I said, hey, are you a refugee too from the Chinese church? And they smile. And I said, well, why are you here? Because obviously they could be in a Chinese church. There's several, even within Lexington, they could choose to go to. And many of them tell me that they've made it a very um, intentional choice. Uh, one of them said to me, my kids are growing up beside people who are very different than Chinese folk. And they said, I want my children to be playing and worshiping with their friends. And so we come here. She said, I can give them culture at home. But um, here, I want them to meet God. Now, when I was growing up as a kid in our Chinese church, we went to church for culture. We went because they were afraid we were going to lose it. <laughs> and so they were very happy to give us language and reinforcement and all that sort of stuff. So it's very interesting, I think, the, culture, the sense of, of placement in, in American life and culture now, that a person who's an immigrant, this woman was an immigrant from China, um, and she just said, we can do culture at home. We don't need it at church. We're here because we like the mix. So I, I think that's what we appeal to at, at Grace Chapel. We, we find folk... Um, there's different histories for each immig immigrant community. So we have uh, Korean American, the biggest grouping of that 30% is about um, 
let me give you the, it's API, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders about 20%, um, black including African American and Africans about 4%, Hispanic is about 4%, and multi-ethnic other is 2%. Um, but of the API crowd, um, probably the larger portion are Chinese and Chinese extraction, and then the next group is Korean. So when I ask the Korean folk, why are you here? And they all kind of smile, and then finally they say, oh, uh, for some of us, this is our grace moment. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, oh, our church just went through a split. <laughs> and um, we come here to kind of have a time away and to, to be fed in the scriptures. And then, you know, we're, we're probably going to go back to one of those churches at some point once the, you know, the air settles and the water is calm. And uh, so they're in a big church like ours, that's great. We have many people who come who are recovering from hard church situations, and we're just glad that they come. You know who they are because when you try to greet them, they kind of don't look at you and they may go right to the door. <laughs> don't draft me for anything, I'm in recovery. And that's cool, that's cool, but uh, that's, one, that's one of the things I think that we can contribute to the body of Christ as a whole is a welcome for folk like that, and then send them back out um, should they want to do that again. Um, so that's often the Korean person's story. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, the African, uh, we have a good group of Africans, some who are here, um, who are uh, political refugees and other folk like that, that have just come and settled. And uh, some of them, you know, the typical international student who stay, but also folk, um, there's one friend from Uganda, he just won the lottery. And so he's more of a working class kind of guy. He's not your, you know, Brandeis student or Harvard PhD. He's, he's trying to figure out how, how to make it work. He rides his bike from Waltham to Brandeis, uh, to, excuse me, to Bunker Hill Community College because that's all he can afford. So, so there's a whole diversity. And, and that's the other thing I want to shoot about your fallacy. When I first came, I thought um, Grace Chapel equals money. And it, there is, obviously, there are people in the congregation who are, who are generous and who, are, who have economic means. But we have workers, we have folk who are uh, union people, we have folk who've been unemployed and all the rest. I remember when a gentleman was unemployed and his life community, his small group, uh, committed themselves to, they called it, let's keep Harold employed. And so each of them chose house projects, he was a carpenter. Each of them chose house projects that they knew Harold could help them with. And they gave him work so that he could make it through that time of unemployment. So, you know, yes, prosperous, but yes, also folk who are without, um, people who've worked in the nursery have been homeless. So we have, that, we have that whole socioeconomic as well as an ethnic diversity. Great, thanks, Jeanette. So Danny, uh, we know that you have, you know, just from your message today, just very powerful. Tell us about the Hispanic community here in the U.S. Well, um, I'm not a missiologist, I'm an Old Testament prof. So what I'll tell you is from my own experience and, and as I read and travel, but I would say several things. One thing that helps in terms of work in Hispanic communities is they come from a Christian culture of Latin America, you see, which uh, was historically Roman Catholic. So you don't have to convince them about God or Jesus or the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Uh, so that helps. Um, about two-thirds of those who come will be Roman Catholic. Uh, so when we talk about the vibrancy of the church, in the broad sense, what you're seeing is Hispanics are revitalizing the Catholic church in this country. Uh, so just don't think about evangelicals. I would mention three issues uh, that might be helpful uh, for you all to know. One is the Hispanic church is overwhelmingly poor. Uh, the, those who have come, I work with undocumented. So the undocumented ones uh, would be day laborers. They cut the grass, they do the landscaping, they wash the dishes, they clean the houses, um, they do construction. So it's a poor church. But ironically, um, it's very much health and wealth gospel. About 85% of the Hispanic church would be Pentecostal. And some of that in the health and wealth gospel stream of Pentecostalism. And one of the things that we're seeing, um, and I was talking to Alvin Badia earlier, uh, and to JC, JC's somewhere, there he is, Juan Carlos, uh, the growing movement of uh, self-proclaimed apostles and prophets. I mean, so if we talk about vibrancy, it's a complicated vibrancy. Um, so we need to keep that in perspective. The second thing I would say would be you have to talk about legality in the Hispanic church. 
this is a massive issue. Uh, in the church I go to, over 100 members, maybe 115 or 20 with the children, uh, I could probably count on one hand those who have documents, and that includes the pastor and his wife. Uh, the rest will be undocumented. So what you have is a lot of mobility. Uh, they will move uh, out of fear. Uh, they will move uh, for work, um, which affects leadership training, which affects elders, which affects all kinds of things. Um, we have uh, two families now that are in deportation proceedings, uh, where the father is in deportation proceedings, uh, which divides families. And so now you're talking about family ministry in a way you probably never have thought of before. What do you do with the wife and children that stay behind? Uh, so uh, legality, you can't talk about Hispanic ministry without uh, legality. And just think of pastoral work as going to detention centers and trying to hook up lawyers and dealing with uh, uh, broken families um, done, done in by the immigration service. And the last thing, what is making Hispanic ministry harder is that they come for the American dream. And the American dream is things. And so they will work two or three jobs, and many of them will fall slave to the American dream and then become materialized. You know, they have their troca now and uh, color television and they send money home. And so um, what we're seeing is, is, is a growing materialism. So again, it, we can talk about immigrant vitality, but if you're actually pastoring on the ground versus kind of missiological euphoria, which is sometimes where we, where we fly, uh, it's hard work. Um, what I tell my students is ministry is hard, but it is good. So I invite you to the good side, which is with people. Thank you, Danny, for reminding us of the challenges that immigrants go through. And, you know, when... Uh, we hear we were talking about uh, the because when immigrants move from one culture to another, there's all of this chaos and dependency issues, and and um, and actually that's when the gospel seems to also take root, and there seems to be more opportunities that we even see if they had not left their homeland. So maybe starting with Dr. Park, if you can explain, you know, how uh, some of the challenges, but also what what are the what have we seen some of the benefits and some of the opportunities that, that the church, Korean church, has, has grown in? Well, the best benefit of uh, you being an immigrant is uh, uh, to borrow someone else's phrase, uh, you are under the grace of uh, desperation. You're desperate because you've become vulnerable and therefore for you are ready to reach out for help beyond your immediate circle. Uh, consider that for a moment. Uh, you just immigrated, leaving the entire family behind. So what's your immediate circle? Uh, none. They're out there somewhere, but not here with you. So you are reaching out for help and that's the opportunity that the churches in immigrant context can grab and bring hope and help in the lives of, uh, of the immigrants. At the time, uh, Korean immigration or uh, exile, rather, uh, started at the beginning of the 20th century the percentage of Christians in Korea was less than a percent. Today, we count about 20% Christians in Korean population back in Korea. What about Korean society here in America? 80% Christians. So that number alone will show you how effective an environment of immigration has created 
for Korean Christians, I mean, uh, 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 Korean people to come to know the Lord. Obviously, there are several uh, minor other uh, uh, factors in play behind because uh, 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 it is largely from the urban sectors that these immigrants are drawn and uh, 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 churches tended to grow in urban sectors back in Korea. So uh, uh, there tends to be more Christians immigrating. But at the same time, uh, one statistics shows that about 70% of the Christ, uh, uh, Koreans living abroad are originally from North Korea, just like my mother. So it is, again, the people in transition, the people in motion who desperately seek for God's help. And that's what has been in play here. So what's the benefit? Well, having watched my father come to know the Lord uh, when I was 23, and my mother having prayed all those years, and having to go through 20 different failures before he came to acknowledge uh, Jesus as his own Savior, uh, worldly sufferings can uh, surround you, but out of all that, you've reached out and you've been touched by God's grace. That, I would say, is the greatest grace and benefit of being an immigrant. Bianca, why don't you also share, and then Jeanette? Sorry, yeah. So I, I think um, the, the reality of um, being an immigrant and, and living sacrificial, like, I mean, there's been a lot of um, sacrifice for immigrants to leave their home countries and to build roots here and and um, vulnerability and and I think um, and this is yeah I only can agree um, with Dr. Park but I also want to say that that this the reality of immigrants that like, really impacts the immigrant churches and um, the struggle of survival um, is reflected in of each personal or each individual is also reflected in the struggle of survival within the immigrant churches and, and that there's um, a lot of um, challenges to, to be um, an immigrant church and to pastor in immigrant churches. And I think as we, as we look about ministering to immigrants, Together, I think as as the part of the European American majority culture, it's really important to have in in mind what are the issues of of the immigrants, what are they really struggling, and also what does it not only the um, the financial issues, but also what, what does it mean to be an immigrant, um, a minority in a majority culture? What are the, the power dynamics that are at place. And, and I think that this is um, talking about a holistic uh, ministry to immigrants. I think that's a really important part and for us to engage with the immigrant churches to really understand um, what it means to better minister to them. I feel like I'm the practitioner at the table. So let me just give you one example of, of how I saw our Chinese, we have, um, we call them life communities, which is Grace Chapel Speak for a small group. So I, we have um, some ethnic specific life communities, mostly for language uh, comfortability. So we have Korean, Spanish, uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, and there are probably some others that are just friendship groups that have met and gather. But in the Chinese group, it's very interesting, these folk, most of these folk are from mainland China, and many of them came, and one of the spouses came to faith first, you know, and so they were praying for an unbelieving spouse. And uh, what we found is that through their life together, um, it's been not threatening to usually the man to become part of that community. So we've actually seen several of the, the men, the spouses of these uh, believing wives come to faith, and it's it doesn't happen easily, you know, but I, I think the cultural displacement, which is what both folk here have been hinting at, the, the social and the cultural displacement that comes with immigration, uh, just it, 
throws the life as you know it a bit on, on end, and it makes you open and scared, and it, it changes things for you. So these men um, have reluctantly come. I remember being at one of those life communities one time, and the husband, he just ran in and grabbed his wife and said, time to go, and he zipped out, you know, like, I don't want to get contaminated by these Christians. Ah, you know, it, my, it's catching. And then a couple years later, uh, he was in the baptismal tank, you know, uh, professing life, his new life in Christ. And, and I think it's because that group loved him and he became safe. He became friends with some of the other men in the group. And all those kinds of things happened. Um, so I see evangelism happening as folk face this cultural and social displacement as well. For the second generation, that's me. I was mixed up. My parents were Chinese speaking. I grew up more English speaking. And I felt crazily conflicted. You know, who do I, who do I belong to? What am I a part of? Um, and over time, uh, for me, uh, biblically, the value of becoming a citizen of the kingdom uh, really made sense versus a citizen with the, you know, the blue passport. Because I found for certain times, uh, my blue passport, I wasn't seen as an American. And other times when I was in Taiwan, for example, and even wearing Taiwanese threads and getting a Taiwanese haircut and thinking I really blended in, they knew I was not. <laughs> you know, even before I spoke, I said, darn, I haven't even spoken yet, you know? But, you know, so, so the folk who are the next generation, there's a lot of conflict at home and, and inside. Um, often parental expectations are different than what the kids feel from the school system and the rest. And, um, and that's a point of disconnect where, where ministers of the gospel, where you all who are training to be pastors, it's a great time to come alongside somebody who's experiencing that cultural displacement and, and just journeying with them telling them that you understand uh, that you've heard these stories before and, um, and that God has a hope for them. It, it, students can really feel torn uh, during that time as they um, interact, as they try to grow up in the mix of multiple cultures. Okay, Danny, I want to ask you something that actually will, you're probably going to talk about tomorrow more in detail. Okay. Uh, and this is sort of a, a giving a heads up. But, uh, you know, many of us in this room may have voted on the other side of the equation uh, for immigration reform, whatever that was. And, you know, what, how do Thanks we... Thanks for that. <laughs> so how do we as evangelicals can better understand the issues of some people term, you know, illegal immigrants, and that's a very un-PC term, and so your undocumented workers is what you would want to talk about. Tell us a little more about that and how we can be more aware. Wow, uh, you just threw me a curveball. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe a, a few things, um, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to stop myself because you may have pushed a button, and you need to know where the off button is. But um, one of the things in terms of kind of tying in, there is this openness to the gospel up to a point. Uh, the materialism piece I mentioned, the Catholic piece. Uh, but what happens in undocumented churches, there is a higher incidence of drug abuse, alcoholism, spouse and child abuse, uh, because they live under so much social pressure. Um, they're scared. <clears throat> they live in the shadows. They, uh, in Aurora, uh, police can act as immigration agents and pull them over just for their skin color. Uh, and we've seen that. I have friends that's happened to. Um, so, there's a life in the shadows that complicates the desperation. I mean, thing, one, one thing is coming and you're legal as a refugee or you come in a student visa or worker visa or something. But uh, if you come, um, you know, from a small rancho, as they would say in Mexico, uh, there's a whole other layer of stuff of the desperation that I think we need to appreciate. Um, you know, if you want me to talk about immigration reform, golly, I would just say a few things. Um, and then we can, and I'm happy to, t I can talk about this for hours, so I'm happy to talk with anybody uh, afterward. But I would say this, on the one hand, uh, I think of Romans 12, and Alvin would be, Dr. Padilla would be proud because I'm speaking out of the New Testament uh, on this one. Um, but, you know, it says don't be conformed to the world, right? But be renewed, your mind be renewed, um, so that you will be able to discern what the will of God is. And I would say it's true in the immigration debate. Our views have been molded by the media. And what we need is to have it transformed and renewed by the word of God. And I would challenge 
uh, Christians to give me Christian discussions and just don't throw Romans 13 at me. If that's the extent of your Christian ethic, again, I'm leaving tomorrow, so I'm going to be blunt. That's pretty sad. Um, there's so much more in the Bible, so come tomorrow. We'll see some more. Um, so think through a comprehensive biblical response that gets beyond Romans 13 and American nationalism and own the fact that we are strangers and that we don't need to defend this strange place like some Christians do. The other thing I would say is um, get to know immigration law. It is so messed up and so contradictory and so limited. The working assumption by Americans is it, it's an American law, it must be good. That's kind of the working assumption. The problem that we have is U.S. immigration law focuses on entry. It doesn't really have categories for if you're already here, except deportation. So this is one of the reasons why we're trying to get immigration reform, is to somehow begin to engage the reality of 11 and a half million people who have nowhere to go. There's no office, no fine to pay, no form to fill. If you are here undocumented, there is nothing you can do to rectify your situation. Under current U.S. law, there are no provision, provisions for you to legalize your status except exceptionally, which is very hard to get. So we can talk about that. So I would say, as Christians, we need to understand the Bible, understand U.S. immigration law, and understand immigration history. The Chinese Exclusion Act was very cruel. That was our first major immigration legislation, was to exclude the Chinese in this country um, from 1882 to 1943 with few exceptions. So all these things, I would say, would be the kind of thing I would hope that if we talk diaspora, missiology among the undocumented, uh, again, getting beyond kind of this 30,000-foot discussion on the ground, uh, it's complicated. Um, the complicated is good. And so... Um, that's how, I, you know, I don't know what you're asking for me. I mean, you asked me a very general question, so I'm just kind of giving you a general answer. Um, maybe say one last thing. Can I say one last thing? Okay. Um, my experience as I travel the country over these last few years is that every major U.S. evangelical denomination now wants to start immigration ministry because they're growing, and the immigrant communities are what's keeping denominational numbers up or flat. You take away the immigrant churches and every major denomination is going down among the Anglo population. So the immigrant churches are actually keeping it, those numbers afloat. But uh, kind of in line with what I said this morning, if you were in chapel, is what, as I talk to Hispanic pastors, what happens is the people who run a lot of those outreaches uh, are non-ethnic people. And so what happens sometimes is it's very paternalistic and very much about power and money. So we can talk about diaspora and ministering and things like that, but the reality on the ground, once you move into the denominational offices, can be very much about power, about race, um, and privilege. So that's a whole other discussion that we could get to when we talk about diaspora missiology, is not only ministering among the diaspora, but ministering out of those offices, and what does that look like? Yeah, so those are, those are the kind of difficult discussions that I would hope at a seminary you get to. Great, thanks. Well, you definitely want to hear more about that tomorrow. Um, now, I know that uh, it seems like there, you've mentioned a lot of the needs and the growth of the church, but we, we want to hear some stories of how the immigrant churches are actually doing outreach, how they're doing church planning, how can we learn from you and how God's moving in your midst? And I'll open up for... Can I start? Then we'll go. Okay. Um, sorry if I'm talking too much, but I had my coffee and I'm good to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hispanics are evangelistic at their core. And so one of the things that we can learn from the Hispanic community is just evangelism. Uh, our church uh, in, in Aurora does, you know, evangelism outreach, door-to-door -door kind of stuff. 
uh, and other activities. And so I would say, be, you know, one of the things in the Holy Shift community, meals and helping one another, those would be two of the things uh, that I would say Hispanic congregations can teach us. And vibrancy and worship can, can be something also that you can see from Hispanics. Um, it gets complicated with the second and third generation. It's another discussion, but those would be some of the things I would say on the Hispanic side. I just add, in, in our multi-ethnic context, it is the, the groups of color that I think are stronger at community than the European-American folk. And uh, I think they're frustrated at the superficiality of some of our relating, and, um, and they're really frustrated at the lack of food. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how white folk do it, but I mean, I always, when I come into a meeting, I'm bringing in a bag of snacks or something like that, and they'll go, oh, and I thought, like, you know, you could do this too. <laughs> Food is social lubrication. You know, this helps a meeting go faster. But, um, but they, you know, it's sort of like clueless, and, and I, I see our, our, our ethnic communities really understanding um, uh, more how to do life together, and uh, sometimes the conversations, unfortunately, are limited to within the ethnic pockets within the church as opposed to the broader church as a whole. Um, other thing I think, um, there's a, of the folk who are believers, there's a real definite commitment to sacrifice, service, and giving. Um, we, you know, as any, many churches and even at a seminary here, you're always doing capital campaigns for something or another. You know, somebody needs, you know, a fire hydrant built. And um, they brought in folk um, who were givers. You know, somebody did some statistics. And I think the, the white leadership of the church were uh, profoundly surprised at the high number of Asians. <laughs> who are just quietly giving significantly to the ministry of the church. And I thought, you guys, don't you know that? You know, <laughs> we, we know what that's about. And I think that was news for them um, because they weren't the expected suspects. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think one other aspect is prayer. I think that we can learn a lot from the immigrant communities about prayer, um, especially from the Koreans, but also there's so um, all night prayers and all that that happens, you know, in every church or in a lot of immigrant churches, a lot and fasting. And also I, I think um, living the gospel more holistically, like in, in the Euro-American, also European, um, reality, we go to church on Sunday and then, um, you know, we go to work, but we don't really bring our faith to work and all that. And I, my experience is that a lot of the immigrants speak so much easier about their faith and what they've experienced with God in a very natural way. And I also agree about the hospitality. Um, it's very different. And also, like, to take time not so serious. I mean, we are really like time-driven culture and I'm German, so I'm probably the one who has to learn most, but I can. <laughs> now, so I think it's, it's not running after like the schedule and sometimes you have to and it's challenging, but just to sit down and, and talk and have community, I think um, that's something we really can, or I can learn from and yeah. Right, a uh, uh, couple of things. Uh, we, in, in Korean uh, community, in the case of Korean community, uh, uh, I refer to this earlier phase of uh, Korean presence in America in the first half of the 20th century as the church in exile. Uh, the time when uh, after those Koreans, first Koreans arrived here, there was no more Korea to go back to, right? So Japan invades and there is no more Korea for half a century. Uh, it's like in the movie where you've landed at an airport and <laughs> you just discovered your homeland just disappeared and uh, you, are, you have nowhere to go back to. So during those uh, uh, first 50 years or so, uh, one of the major aspirations of the Korean Christians in living in America was to train their youngs or whoever would later join their community in church, help them be trained so that one day they will pioneer 
liberating their nation back from the Japanese regime. I think that is a long living tradition that continues today, even though now there is Korea, and the church, the Korean church in America is not any longer in exile. It is de facto uh, an immigrant church now. However, Korean churches throughout America will place heavy emphasis on helping Korean international students in America. Now, if you're living in this area, New England, that's especially so because unlike the average across the nation, the Korean community average across the U.S. is Wherever you live, you will have an average of 1.5% uh, international student living amongst yourselves. In New England, that number is 16%. So it's very high. And New England is also the, the first place where the first Korean uh, 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 students came over to study uh, since old days. So if you would go out, you will see that a lot of churches will invest their energies in helping out international students, Korean international students, in the ways they can. So um, I don't know uh, about other ethnic communities, but uh, uh, South America should have a lot of students coming over too, right? Uh, and uh, I'm sure the churches there are making similar efforts. Now, you can see that this is an effort being made from one part of the Korean community to another Korean community. Have you ever heard of Korean churches trying to evangelize the whites here? It doesn't happen. Because from the inception, Korean church was fostered. The American churches kind of child cared for Korean churches since the beginning. So there is this impenetrable, impenetrable uh, psychological barrier between uh, Korean Christians and American white churches in assuming that the whites must be doing very well. They are the ones that gave us the gospel to begin with. So we only need to focus on taking care of the rest of us. So if the church is able, they will send short mission trips down to South America, Africa, Southeast Asia. But they, it will never occur to the Korean Christian mind living in America that people in, in America need to be evangelized too. That's a barrier that, in my opinion, can only be broken from you guys into ethnic communities. You will not, you will wait for centuries and centuries and you will never see Korean Christians coming out of their own ghetto reaching out to you because of that mental block that has been formed. But American churches need to engage with ethnic churches purposefully. And then, and then we can move on to the next phase of becoming truly multicultural. Right now, the term I prefer using is co-cultural, not multicultural. We coexist as different churches in this society, but we never engage with one another. This is co-cultural. We need to be cross-cultural. And American churches are at the bare hand to be able to initiate that engagement. Great. Um, before we open up the questions, I'm sure many have uh, burning questions to ask. but. Um, one thing I'd like to ask you is if you were to tell us how can we partner practically, you know, we're in our own context here at Gordon-Conwell or even in our churches here in North America, what would be one, very, one or two very practical things that we could do 
to partner, to work together for a multi-partnership um, coexistence. Anyone? I, I think before we can partner, we really need to get to know each other and hear each other's stories and then together develop um, something. Like, for example, um, in Boston, like over a third of the churches share worship space with churches of different ethnic background, and it often is not done well. So there are a lot of conflicts. Like people call us at EGC and say, you know, we have this conflict. And I think the issue is that there is no real communication. And, and before we talk about partnership, I think we are like doing something together. We really need to listen to each other and um, also on an eye level and really have this mental model that the immigrant churches um, bring something to the table that we need and that they are blessing us. And, and I, think, I think having this relational basis is, is number one of um, getting engaged. And then from then on, we can move together, but without these like eye level engagement with each other, um, really there, it's very difficult and it gets really pater paternalistic, um, the relationship yeah, and, and that's, that's why in, in my experience what a lot of the um, diaspora missionaries and pastors like we talk to and work with, they are really, there's a lot of like disappointment in the relationships to the majority culture churches just because they are not heard and validated, validated. and I think there's a lot of like a learning curve that needs to happen. Go ahead, Danny, you so, look like. Yeah, um, this is kind of a question. Uh, what's the end game? You know, um, this is a part of the issue, and this, I'm going to take a bit further what you said. I mean, is the end game so that the Anglo church can engage non Anglos? And does that mean that they become like Anglos? I mean, is, is that the end game? For most people, that's kind of what it is. We go eye eye, and then when they get more like us and understand our ways, then we can do the cross-cultural thing. And that's where it's kind of hard. Uh, if your heart language is in English, how do you do that? I mean, if, if it is about food and a lot of, I don't know about the Asian side, but in the Hispanic, it's very much touch, right? Um, family. I mean, so th that would be the thing that I would say. Um, What's the end game of, of that discussion? And that's open-ended, so I'm not gonna give an answer. Um, the other thing that I would say um, is that whatever the end game is, um, which will involve assimilation, assimilation, the majority culture needs to understand this, is the negotiation of loss on the immigrant side. You negotiate away your language, you negotiate away your, your customs, you negotiate, and negotiate away some of your family values. It, assimilation into the majority culture is a negotiation of loss. Um, painful. Um, so, um, so if you were to ask me, okay, so now what do we do? On that end, I'm not sure. Um, at the very least, I would say we, if one is in majority culture, is serve, ESL, after school tutoring, just serve and see where God takes it. I don't know, and I don't know what the end game is yet. And maybe if someone defined that, uh, we could have that conversation in a more substantive way. Well, partly responding to uh, Dan's question, uh, lately I've been entertaining this, uh, this, uh, model of a church that so far only exists in my mind. Um, what if an American church together with an ethnic church will start a community where the parents will meet in their own languages but will have 
their Sunday school run together. So say the American church, the white church comes in the morning. Their children will have their own Sunday school session slightly after that. At that time, the ethnic church drops their kids there too. And after everything's over, the ethnic church has its own uh, uh, worship time too. So the common element between the two being this second generation together. So the white church will have its own pastor. The ethnic church will have its own pastor. The second generation from both churches together will have its own pastor. Let it grow that way. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Eventually, that second generation is not a second generation any longer. But it, the time will arrive when that particular group will start assuming the role of a new first generation. By that time, we just heard about loss, negotiating loss, yes. The parent generation has been dealing with the negotiation of loss of your own uh, 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 interest, some peculiar interests. But you've done it so that your second generation together will be building a future of its own. And by the time the second generation is come of age, let their pastor become the senior pastor of all the three congregations together and leave it in the hands of that generation to uh, finish the job. So what's the end game in that case will be in the hands of that second generation who grew up together without wall. Just a mental exercise I've been having. Okay, any final words, Jeanette? Okay. Um, we're going to open up the time for questions from the floor here. So um, do we have a microphone? We'll go with Michael here. I, I want to follow up with your, um, your ideal church. Uh, I'm from uh, the Chinatown Church, Boston Chinese Evangelical Church. We have 1,300 people, 99%, uh, 99.9% are Chinese, and we have uh, seven congregations. And then uh, from what I wanted to uh, follow up is that um, um, I am from the Chinese side, but then my kids are on the English side. And then more and more I'm seeing white people and black people coming to our church. And uh, that has never been done before because, like, we are so 99.9% .9 uh, Chinese. But then, uh, uh, but our our next generations is more accommodating to seeing uh, blacks and whites coming to our church, and they are making friends and they are brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. Uh, but for our Chinese congregation, it's still actually 100% uh, Chinese. So. Our, from what you are saying, uh, it is happening, and then uh, I think our uh, second generations and the third generations are going to accomplish that. Thank you. Okay. Back there. A couple of years ago, I was working on a construction site, and uh, the Hispanic guys were leading an evangelistic Bible study, <laughs> which was absolutely incredible. And I grew up in Guatemala, so I kind of understand what you were talking about in chapel. Um, so this is a question from a white Guatemalan to a tall Guatemalan. Um, you, you, you raise this reality of that the Latin American church does have this issue of poverty. Um, so if, if we're coming from a white American background where we're probably wealthy in comparison, and we're trying to partner with a Hispanic community in their church, either in a overseas setting or doing evangelism in the United States, how do you negotiate these money, wealth issues when you have a white church or a white person who can struggle with the paternalistic idea and then you have a Hispanic or another culture that might come from a a more poor context. How do you 
negotiate that ministry together when the realities are that one person or one church has a lot of money and the other one doesn't. Well, let me just take a stab. Um, Let me just preface it with this. Even how we're approaching this conversation, if you've listened to it, the working assumption is the American church is white. I don't know why we're doing that, but we are. I'm seeing some African Americans in the room. I wonder how they're listening to this conversation. That's the first point. Um, What I've seen, and I'll just make some comments about what I've seen, because again, um, you know, this isn't my business. I mean, I mean, so th- this is what I live, and so if, if I were in the missiology department, I could probably, you know, give you like three points and a poem at the end or something. Um, but what I've seen in, in the church that 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 uh, the church that that our church meets in in the afternoon has five ethnic churches that meet in the afternoon. So we're just one of five. Uh, there's an Ethiopian, a Korean. Um, a Russian, us, and a Filipino church all meet in the same building in the afternoon. Uh, what the pastor has done is, you know, the working assumption is the disparity in, in economics, but one of the things, at least on a Christian level, is once a quarter to meet together for, for a time of singing and communion. Um, and then the pastors will, will, will share the pulpit. So, I mean, there, it's just, I think it's an effort to meet at a Christian level. I think uh, meeting at a socioeconomic level uh, is more complicated. And the other piece um, that makes it complicated is the, the majority church that meets in the morning is primarily Anglo. And, and, and I hate to keep bringing this up, but it's, it's, it's unavoidable in the Hispanic community. One of the barriers is the legality issue. Some Anglos don't even want to be around undocumented. And I know of some undocumented churches that have been kicked out of Anglo churches because the Anglos didn't want illegals on their property. Um, So, you know, that's how I would begin to get at it. I don't know if you can overcome some of those barriers. Uh, What I see sometimes on the Anglo side is well-meaning naivete. And you've been around that, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and the paternalism. I mean, so you, you got to avoid that. So I don't have an easy answer. Those are just some general thoughts, and, and the accumulated wisdom of, of, of the panel, I'm sure, could could add to that. Can I can I add something? So I think it's that's an issue with all of the immigrant communities, and and I think the issue is so it's not only about money, and I mean it's connected to power, but I think um, it embracing our own poverty. So, I mean, we are all poor to some extent, not necessarily with money, but with other issues. And I think if we have like this honest conversation about our own poverty um, and, you know, spiritual or just kind of the way we, we approach life and materialism is nothing really to be proud of, and if if we if we have like honest conversation about that and and validate the gifts like the other cultures like the spiritual gifts other culture bring to the table, um, and and give them the pulpit and and leadership I think um, and and let them their lead their way and not the way we would want to have things getting done and I think then we can talk about really engaging with each other, but it's just not happening the way we want to do it, and they just come along. That's not how it works, and it's kind of sacrifice and giving up the power as the majority culture we possess, and I think that's, it's more honestly like a mental issue, like, and and how do we perceive it, and and, um, unless this doesn't like happen, um, I think it's really, difficult to talk and and I think another thing is like we need to acknowledge that um, 
there, there is the power imbalance, like the socioeconomic and racial power balance in our society, and race is an issue. And if we just say, well, as Christians, we are all the same, that doesn't help. Like the color blindness is really destructive for partnerships because then we don't acknowledge the pain and the loss of the immigrant community, and, and that makes yeah, it creates a not being heard, and I think that's that's really um, difficult then. Well, part of the reason I suggested focusing on the second generation or the children's group was uh, for that practical reason. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm s simply trying to be more realistic that after several attempts and different uh, 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 trials I've had, uh, I'm coming to be more realistic that uh, among the first generation it is very hard to achieve uh, 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 that kind of uh, common uh, goal. Uh, but when, and, uh, when, when we focus on the second generation, and limiting, limiting all the budget issues to that particular ministry alone, and each church contributing equally toward that end, uh, I think uh, I would assume that uh, a more man manageable uh, solution would be found. But again, uh, I haven't personally tried it yet. Jeanette, I think maybe you could also share a little bit of, you know, being in varsity, actually considered one of the most multi-ethnic uh, organizations out there, and then, of course, Grace Chapel. But how is it being a minority with power and with whites and so on? Maybe you can give us a little of your perspective. Yeah, I, I was with InterVarsity for 30 years, um, so pretty much my first job after uh, graduating and getting a fellowship and all that stuff, I was on Ivy staff, and my last role, one of my last roles at InterVarsity was I was the vice president for multi-ethnic ministries. So I did a lot of thinking on this thing, but um, the power dynamic and self-awareness of power and, and all is, a, uh, is an oversight by the people in power. So if you don't think that you're powerful, it's your privilege to, to realize that you, you have that role, you have it, because <laughs> you don't have to think about it. And those who don't have it, think about it, because you don't have it. And so often I find that when I would, and I'm sorry, I'll just single out, I know white males are really um, a beleaguered, uh, attacked group, but often um, the, the lack of awareness of this thing is because you are in, in power. The, the system in, in the U.S. is skewered towards you. Um, you know, um, if I was a white guy, <laughs> um, there would probably be a different response to me than being a small Asian lady, you know? And that's just the reality. And you see it all the time. You see it in people's faces when they see, you know, I, I, I bet if you're a white man, you don't have somebody coming up to you and say, what country are you from? <laughs> I am from Boston. <laughs> You know, go socks. But you know, these kinds of things, it's when, you're, when you're a woman, when you're a minority person, um, you go through life thinking about this. And you have to exegete your culture. And that's um, something that minority folk do all the time. And so I tell people at Grace Chapel that I've studied you. I mean, I, I, know what this, I know what makes this culture tick because for me to survive, I've had to figure it out. Let me just give you a small example. In a Chinese home, we cut up everything and we serve it to you and it's all cut in small pieces and we serve it in a, you know, chopsticks in a bowl and it's all there, right? So you can just get a mouthful and you feed, that, feed yourself that way. First time I went to a Western meal in, from, from my family background, I was sitting beside it and somebody was, they served me, I was at a mother-daughter banquet, I think I was in fourth grade. Mrs. Malcolm and I were both given a ham steak. And I said, shoot. I don't know what to do with a ham steak, you know. <laughs> I thought, first I thought, how rude, they didn't cut it for me. And then I realized, you know, this cutlery, you know, and I wasn't born in a cave, but I didn't know what to do because my family doesn't do that. So I watched Mrs. Malcolm. Whenever she cut, I cut. Whenever she ate, I ate. And she, darn it, she was really tiny, so she didn't eat much. And I was very hungry at the end of the meal, but I watched her etiquette. But as a minority person, I had to learn how to use a knife and fork properly to survive in this culture, okay? You don't need to know how to use chopsticks and eat in a Chinese meal in this culture if you're a dominant culture of people. That's the big difference. You could do it because it's exotic, or you do it because you like to you know, be more Chinese when you're at the restaurant, but you didn't need it for cultural survival. 
I needed to learn Western things for cultural service. That's kind of what I'm trying to say is one of the main differences with the power dynamic that comes. And so my brother in the back, the fact that you even asked that question is wonderful. I know Andy Crouch is coming a little later this month. He's just written a book on this power thing, and it's the, the lead article in CT this week, and he talks that we all have it. And so the question as Christians is what do we do with it, and how do we use it for the kingdom? And um, I think we're being terrifically naive when we don't ask questions about power and power dynamics. I think we're being terrifically naive when we don't talk about race, because pigment of skin does matter, and it does determine a lot of things. And if we just are willing to say, yes, let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya. But before we do that, there's a lot of conversation that has to happen. There's a lot of um, painful, you've got to be taken to school and told some things, you know, before we can really have that honest, um, hold your hand moment because we know one another. And so don't settle for staying at the surface. That's what Danny's been saying. Don't settle for this, these Kodak moments of brotherhood and sisterhood. There's a lot more. Um, when we really jump into one another's lives, we suffer together, we think together, we enter into our brothers' and sisters' uh, shoes and moccasins. A lot more to learn about who God is in his fullness. So that's a great invitation. Hi. Um, I just wanted to tell you about our home church. It's called Transformation Church. Ken and I just flew in this morning from uh, Charlotte. And uh, Transformation Church is, about, is new. It's only about three years old. But it was designed with the intent to be multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-generational. Uh, its pastor is Duran Gray, who uh, used to play for the um, uh, Panthers as well as the uh, Colts. Okay, NFL football anyway. And uh, it, it truly is multicultural. And... I understand that it would be very difficult to take two existing churches and blend them together. But um, it, you look around, he says, uh, one of his sayings is that Sunday morning is the most segregated time in this country, and that's true. But he is successfully bringing together races and, and cultures and, uh, and under one roof. Uh, just in the last three weeks, Ken and I have been working with a, a couple from Korea that left the Korean church and wanted to be multi-ethnic, multicultural. So um, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to, to blend two churches together. But when you start out with that intent, it, it's like um, so much easier. Okay. Um, let's go with uh, Esther. Thank you all for coming. I'm first, my name is Esther, I'm first semester MDiv student. And I just have a quick comment that um, sometimes that we, we do ne need to sit down and hold hands, even if it is uncomfortable. Um, my background is my mom is from the Philippines, Chinese Filipino, and my father is American from here and uh, from Ohio originally. And um, I think growing up here in the States and in Germany, ich kann auf Deutsch sprechen, I speak oh. German. Yeah, and um, so I've traveled all around the world. In the past 10 years, I had a, a job in defense and intelligence. So I've lived and I breathed among people of all different colors and stripes. It, so if my mom were here, you wouldn't even know she's here. She's very fair, very short, very Asian. And she would say, Esther, come now. <laughs> and she has a very heavy accent. And my father is very tall, African-American. So I sort of lived and grew, and he's a chaplain in the military, so I had the military culture as well. Mm. And so I learned growing up and treating people, I, I had to sit down and hold hands and sing Kumbaya, whether or not someone else did it. And so I, I just, um, not to pick on you, Auntie, because I, That's fine. she was very instrumental and in really even her speeches, I remember when I was at Urbana 93 and 96. So, um, I just try to, and actually I'm a member of a mostly all Anglo church back in Arizona, and I've been to all different kinds of churches here, and I really don't see, well, where, should I go to a white church or a black church or Asian church? I, and I'm part of KSA and my small group women's, whom I meet with, they're all uh, mostly Korean, Korean Korean and Korean American. So I can feel di comfortable in different situations, but I've had to learn to sit down and hold hands with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Key word for me, and growing up, my parents are very strong believers. 
both seminary grads, both very evangelistic in, in sharing, and we've housed missionaries over our house, is, is that my identity, first and foremost, and even coming out of here is not to build a multicultural church, but first and foremost is to live and to breathe all things Christ and scripture. And so I will continue to sit down and hold hands with my brother in Christ and not frame him in some sort of a mental image of who I think he is, because I don't know. I know that he and his wife are, are past, are, have been busy with Campus Crusade. So I see him as a brother in Christ. So I think the discussion, I think there's a lot of good things that have been said here, but I think really as, um, as a global Christian and how I see myself, it's really all about are we examples for Christ and are we living in Christ and do we see each other through Christ's eyes? And so that's my point. <laughs> okay, I think our time is up. I'm, I'm sure you have other questions. Feel free to come and uh, talk to us afterwards. Um, we're going to close in prayer now and let's join hands with our brothers across <laughs> and sisters across and feel the uncomfortableness, but yet knowing that we are one. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we come before you as brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing that you are a God who breaks through all the differentness that we have, the cultural barriers, the, the hurts, the pains, the prejudices. And Lord, yet through all that suffering and all that movement of people, yet we have seen and we celebrate how you are doing mighty works among people who are on the move. And we especially lift up all the groups that were mentioned, uh, even those that were not mentioned. And we know that there's many, including uh, Nigerians and Hispanics uh, who are from other, cult uh, other countries. We pray for... Um, the Kenyans and the Haitians, many, Lord, Cambodians, Lord, who are here and yet need the gospel and also, Lord, are doing great work. And so, Father, we celebrate your diversity. We want to, Lord, partner together. Teach us this week how we can be more engaged in your world. We pray these things giving thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.